started. It's uh, with great pleasure that I'm going to introduce Bob Curley and Jim Taylor from the University of Pennsylvania. They specifically asked me not to say anything about them other than that they work at the Center for Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics, and they promised that they didn't have anything to say about elections, so there'll be no mudslinging this morning. <laughs> Bob and Jim, none at all. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, this morning. I talked with some of the people as they came in, and I, I have a bit of a sense of about who's here this morning. We have some epidemiologists, and do we have any biostatisticians? And we do have data people. Right, that's, that's, an, that's an excellent mix. Uh, Jim and I work for Dick Landis, who's the head of biostats at Penn, and Har Feldman, who's the head of clinical epidemiology at Penn. And we've got sort of a, you know, 40 odd group of people who specialize in data and IS and IT. And we're going to talk with you about data this morning and bear with me because I'm going to ease into this. Um, we, we have two parts to this presentation. And I'm going to take about 20 minutes and I'm going to talk I'm going to ease us into a discussion of data because data security is can be an extremely confusing topic. Uh, you get a bunch of IS, IT, data people together, data security people together, and the conversation instantly becomes so technical and so ridden with terms and acronyms that it's almost incomprehensible. So I want to do a little bit of a warm-up and, and get us to the point where Jim's going to talk about some of the specifics of, of data security. This is, this is not intended to be a basic presentation at all, but I, I just want to talk about language a little bit. Um, there's a lot of discussion of private and sensitive all the terms start and everybody gets confused very, very quickly. And it really goes back to some basic, basic language that sets the stage for discussion of security. If I ask you to keep something confidential, that means that I do not want the information disclosed. And, and that's a broad statement. And if I say to you, keep it confidential, keep it private, I may leave it totally to your judgment as to how you achieve that. What's happening now is people are starting to say, in addition to keeping data confidential, keeping it private, we're going to specifically tell you how we want it done. And they're putting forth legislation, and they're putting forth guidance on operational implementation of data legislation, and it becomes very, very, very technical and very confusing very quickly. But if you sort of start with the basics and ease into it, particularly on a project basis, data security is a very easy topic to understand when you really get down to the core of what people are trying to tell you. We go back to the basics. If you have a, a lot of people have safe deposit boxes and banks, they cost money. The bigger they get, the more money they cost. If you go, have to go to the bank to get your stuff, it's inconvenient. You have to drive to the bank, you have to go to the bank, you have to go through security measures to get your stuff out of your security box. Data security is just like that immediately start to incur effort and expense as soon as you decide that data needs to be kept private. As soon as I hand you a sheet of paper and tell you to keep it private, an auditor knows, a data person knows, it has to go into a locked drawer. You will automatically start taking measures. We have, a, we have an auditor in the in the audience, and there are parallels between what we do and what a lot of other people do. And I frequently compare 
data reference because data has evidentiary value. Everything we do, um, and I spoke with someone when I came in this morning, and she said to me, well, as an epidemiologist, I know how important data is. And data is important because it's actually our evidence. And it's comparable to the way other people use evidence. We all know that it has to have integrity because a juror in a criminal court or a civil court or in the court of peer review or scientific review has to be able to say they did everything correctly, they did it by the book. There was an adherence to a stipulated investigative process. And the study data has to be credible. Eventually, a juror is going to have to say, well, I listened to the prosecution, I listened to the defense. I believe the data. I believe the way the prosecution, prosecution is using the data. And if you don't take either one seriously, you can have real problems with the conclusions from your study. There's a chain of custody. I'm sure everybody's watched enough television CSI at this point to understand that there's a chain of custody for evidence. It's got to be collected from an uncontaminated scene, processed, tested, analyzed, stored in an evidence room. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about storing the evidence in the evidence room and present it in support of the conclusions. Everybody knows these. Elements contributing to data quality. If we were going to talk about data management, we would, we would sit and we'd talk about the first four. But that's really what we're not, not what we're going to talk about today. We're, we're going to talk about five and six. The conclusions have to be verifiable. <clears throat> you have to have integrity, and very, very importantly, you don't want the results of your study by And everybody has a tendency to go, well, yeah, we know that. But every single day that goes by, there is more evidence that people either don't know it or they're having a lot of technical problems actually doing it and achieving it. And just like law enforcement, prosecution, we follow a certain set of um, data models and standards, data management issues. We do all of the same things that chain of custody does with hard evidence, DNA evidence, that gets presented to people in support of conclusions. And everybody knows this. Everybody, what, I won't talk politics, but I will talk about the way data comes in. Data was coming in from elections almost instantly last night. Projections were accurate. And they were very, very good. They were very quick, very ahead of time. And the data that used to just belong to a principal investigator that nobody would ever see is public now. You have to share data, you have to give it to the NIH, you've got to give it to anybody <coughs> that wants it, and anybody that asks you for it can scrutinize it. And if they can't reproduce your analysis, they can attempt to repudiate the conclusions of your study. There are, everybody knows there are the technical vehicles now or making private information public, like WikiLeaks. So my, my point is, we're getting a lot of use out of data. A lot more people are seeing data than have ever seen it before. It's not private anymore. It's public domain. And it's being used real time to make decisions. And personalized medicine and the use of data in personalized medicine is an extremely timely example. Um, 
I, I work on the Penn Chop CTSA at the University of Pennsylvania. So I, I'm getting a sense of how personalized medicine really needs to use data, how quickly they need the data, and how comprehensive the data needs to be. We have a call, uh, excuse me, this is from Francis Collins. Um, and it says personalized medicine, translation of medicine are very, very, very high priority. Genomics, proteomics, everybody's heard about these fields, everybody's heard about the potential contributions that genomics can make to research. Um, and the challenge is to really get the benefits and apply them for people. And the next slide belongs to Dick Landis, um, who's a biostatistician. And I would never open a slide with this title line. Because Dick says, why has progress been disappointing in personalized medicine? Why is genomics not yielding more information than we were expecting, or in a more timely manner than we were expecting? Uh, and there's been some speculation that, that progress hasn't been what it should be, and that it's attributable to certain causes. One of the causes being common errors in data. Because as you assemble all of this data, technical assembly, storage, um, the analytical process, at any point if an error is made, your results are profound. If you do a one-off in genomics data, you've got a tremendous problem on your hands. That might never be detected unless it's being scrutinized. Well, um, we have a uh, colleague at, at, at Penn, Steve Master, who is in pathology and laboratory medicine. And he published recently about some some problems with data. And this this phrase, forensic bioinformatics, has been emerging. I don't know if anybody's really heard forensic bioinformatics. If you haven't heard it yet, you will. Um, because people are taking data from investigators and scrutinizing it. And just like forensics is science and technology to investigate and establish facts in courts of law, now what we've got is forensic bioinformatics to reconstruct and validate analytical results. And the major journals are having some problems with this. They are having some problems with accepting articles that are being deemed somewhat negative because they're drawing to the attention of the public that there are a lot of data problems. Uh, I don't know if people know this one yet, but I think it's my favorite. Um, and I highlighted in red um, just a portion of the abstract. And it's a succinct, succinct statement. One theme that emerges is, is that the most common errors are simple. That's the one off. Conversely, it is our experience that the most simple errors are common. Uh, another slide from Dick Landis's deck. From Francis Collins. Uh, again, related to the contribution of genomics, you can find out your genetic makeup at this point. But Francis Collins says, you may send a sample off and you may get a result back, but you really don't have any assurance that it's you. Because samples and data to frequent errors. We all know that this one is the real 
sort of the, the real culprit right now. Um, when you work on a project and you start to accrue genetic data, we're now considering the genetic data part of the trial. We're implementing a trial right now where genetic data will just be part of the final data set. And when you start to assemble the genetic data with the phenotype data, you start to get a record per subject. And for a trial, one trial, you may have to start to curate. We've started to proactively, prospectively curate for projects. We know who's got it, what they've done to it, where it's stored, how it's been changed. Not after the fact, not for the analysis, but throughout the entire course of the study. Uh, the long and the short of this is, this is getting difficult to do. It's, it's not like there's one database that's got all the data anymore. And to make matters worse, we've got a research enterprise, and we've got a clinical care enterprise, which is, you know, I mean, they take the data, and they bury it three miles under the ground with the nuclear waste, lock the gates and they tell you your data is safe and secure. It's impossible to get to. But somehow we have to take those research data and combine them with healthcare data. And you start to look at data everywhere, software everywhere, even different networks. If you start to think just about a person you can see that the person's got a name and an AKA and a driver's license and a social security number, and then they've got research enterprise data that may be multiple studies, and they have clinical enterprise data at possibly multiple institutions under multiple medical record numbers. So as you start to think about one person, and you start to assemble their data for research purposes, you're really starting to look at a project that's no longer one person, one investigator with a PC, with a database. This is subject identity management, not the identity management that Jim's going to talk about. This is just the subject. So when you do data curation for a given project, you're going to start to find that these are the many identifiers that will be associated with the subject. You've got kits and specimens and sites and different pieces of software. You've got assays. You've got storage locations. We're recording all of these things now prospectively so that as the study progresses, we have a record of who's got the data, how they identified it, and where it resides. Because once I give someone your specimen that had the number one in my system, you might take it and store it and assign it the identifier A. So all of these identifiers have to, have to be mapped and translated. Uh, we, we, we tend to talk about a trial, but trials don't really exist in isolation much anymore. We've got a, a study, CRIC, um, that Harv Feldman is running at Penn. And w one of the interesting things we've found is the ancillary studies that are being generated by large studies are sort of unbelievable. I, I mean, 23 in 2008, 39 in 2010. And again, we're thrown back into the situation where Bob's and Crick, the 
Bob's in four ancillaries, and Bob's been assigned a different identity in each of the four different ancillaries because the PCC is managing the main site, but all of the sites are managing their ancillary sites locally. So, does that? So, this, this is sort of what we're starting to look at as the segue to security. Um, we protect it with somebody, it goes back to the, the safety problem. It may be valuable. The FDA says protect it. It's been submitted as part of an NDA. It's valuable. Or someone can tell us to protect the privacy, like NIH or the VA. They're all doing that now. They're saying, you have to protect the data. Not only do you have to protect it, we're going to tell you how. And you're going to have to have expert personnel IT people like Jim, who carry special, special certifications, who can read the regulations and interpret and turn those into the IT mechanisms that have to be used to protect the privacy and protect the value of the data. And this is getting more and more specific. They're not just saying to you, keep it private anymore. They're saying, do this, do that, do this, do that. Do these 6,000. What we're finding, and this is my final slide, um, there's a lot of different types of security solutions. You know, if it's an investigator on a PC with a database, and you're working with DA subjects, you may be able to use PGP to encrypt. That may be adequate. But what happens is typically you have groups of people, and they're starting to work with the same kind of data, and the data's, the data's getting more voluminous, more sensitive, more private, and they're all using the same kind of software and they want the data co-located so they can get to it. And you start to scale up to something more than just a PC. And we've seen it happen in healthcare. The evolution has been toward taking all the patient care data and activities and putting it in a private clinical data now. And everybody knows what that's like don't worry much about the privacy of your data because they've got it locked down. But I'm not sure that's the solution for research. So Jim and I work very hard. I represent data. I represent software. I represent the analytical activities. And we talk about those activities. And I talk with Jim about IT and security solutions because I'm not going to let him give me a solution where he locks my data three miles underground with a nuclear waste. So research requires some solution that's different than what healthcare has done, in my opinion. Having said that, I'll switch you over to Jim. And Jim, if you would please um, Explain. I, I'd like Jim to explain first the technical credentials that he carries, because I've reached the point where I think we have to have people that understand this topic extremely well, who are IT security people and who really know how to implement these solutions, so that the VA is okay and the NIH is. Anybody that's got data is okay with the way you're protecting it. Because more and more, not only are they saying to protect it, they're making us prove that we're protecting it. James? Thank you, Bob. Good morning. Jim Keller. And um, I like to I like to do this with Bob because I sit back and I think. You know, during the day, my job's hard. I have a lot of complications, a lot, of, a lot of technical things that I have to work through. And then I listen to Bob, and I think my job's pretty easy compared to what the PIs and the investigators have to deal with with their data. And um, uh, it makes uh, my job that much easier when I think that someone else has a harder job than me. So, <laughs> so I thank you for that. Um, 
Um, my credentials essentially come out of a, an organization called ISACA. And back in the day, and I'll date myself, there used to be an organization called EDP Auditing back when there was like one mainframe per company. And the EDP auditors used to go out and they used to look at data. They, yeah. So this is not a new topic. This is a very old topic. Um, ISACA has transformed from EDP auditing to information systems auditing controls. And the credentials that they provide me with, and I participate with that organization quite frequently, is one, uh, security, information security management. So I look at overall enterprise-wide systems. Uh, another credential is for the governance of IT. So uh, in order to actually have a framework around all this data and, and the levels of data that you have to manage, um, there needs to be some governance of IT. And I'll address that as I go through describing Penn as one of many unique organizations that have IT, you know, that's different than any other organization. Every organization is unique when you start talking about what their IT systems look like and everything. So um, those are my credentials looking forward. Um, my background, just to let you know, so I have a little bit of input into this, is I used to be an accountant. So I was on the finance side, and then I went into IT designing financial accounting systems. So that's dealing with financial data and the like. And then I dropped into healthcare many years ago, and we started doing this with uh, healthcare data. Linked up with Bob about 15, 17, 18, 21. I, I've known his kids from the time they were born. Uh, anyway, linked up with Bob, and um, in that he deals with the data, I try to wrap that up in IT. So I may get technical, uh, stop me if I start talking too fast, but, um, I want to talk about what systems I'm putting in place to surround this clinical data that we're working with, this research data, and what we're currently involved with, which is pretty exciting for me because it is technical and uh, I get my hands wet in doing new and current uh, adventures while trying to give you the best environment from a PI perspective and a clinical trials perspective and getting access to that data while it's still safe. So Bob mentioned about the healthcare. Uh, data network. And so healthcare is out there, hospitals have their systems and they tend to build them separately. Um, at least in academic medical centers, you, you may have a healthcare system and all your research is within that domain. Uh, you look at other ones and healthcare is in one domain, research is in another domain. Uh, you look at Penn and Penn has healthcare in one domain and the School of Medicine is in another domain for research, but there's 27 centers and institutes that are all separately governed and funded, and so you end up looking at these pockets of where your data is at and where the trials are at. It's a very diverse environment for IT, and then you start talking about the current wave with NIH and other investigators working in collaborative teams, and you say, well, now I want to bring all that data together. So the map of how you connect all that data is similar to the map of what Bob was showing you when you try to connect the data to one patient. It's now we're collecting all those pools of data and trying to collect them together and make them match up. So at Penn, what we're doing is uh, pretty exciting, and uh, there's an acknowledged need in the research side where we have multiple centers and institutes doing their own studies, and we do have to come up and secure the data for the regulated data uh, into a private research data network. So this is the acronym that I'm going to use throughout the, my talk here of uh, private data research, private research data network. Um, what this is for is, and again, we go back to the word private, and Bob started out his conversation with uh, confidential, private, and public, is there is a lot of research data that's out there that's in the public domain there's de-identified data that you can use, you can share repeatedly all you want to, and that is not the data that I'm talking about. The data that I want to talk about for the rest of this talk is really the private data, the EPHI data, the personalized health identifiers, uh, data that's regulated, and I'll go through uh, just briefly a little bit of the regulations for those that may not know. Does so everyone know about HIPAA and FSMA and NIST and all that stuff? Um, and FIPS. and FIPS, yeah, FIPS and, and, and all the publications. I'll touch on that just briefly as far as what the regulations are. So for private data and data that actually can identify an individual, 
there needs to be some additional safeguards. So as an investigator sitting at a desk with a PC, you may be managing data and it's de-identified and you're doing your analysis and that works. And you don't have to worry about who's touching your PC, if the PC's locked up or on a private network, that's fine. Um, but if it's personally identified data, there's a lot of regulations that are out there now, starting with HIPAA as far as privacy and security. So what, we're, what I'm going to do is just touch on two slides here. What drives us and what causes us to have to have separate environments that we have to look at for this private data? And what isn't on this slide is when you have your data, you have to start classifying it. You have, to class, you have to know what your data is like, and these are the initial conversations that, that Bob and a lot of our, our project management team have conversations right up front. You have to know what kind of data is going to come down off the trial so that you know where to place it. You can separate it. You have to track it. You have to map it. Uh, you may want it all in one place, but the more regulated the data is and the privates the more costly it is. And that's where, you know, my frustrations lend that I have to talk about systems that I have to build to protect this data, and they're much more costly to build and maintain because it's a very large safety deposit box, in Bob's terms, that I have to buy to put all the data in versus maybe some of the data. So data classifications, the creation of the data, is really what's a good first step. And it's usually something that happens on the backside after you have this bolus of data and you say, oh my, this is private. This is, it's all mangled together. How am I going to manage it? Now there's regulation that I have to adhere to. So the regulations really, laws are being made all the time, starting back in 1996. And I'll, I'll go to my cheat sheets every once in a while here. But 1996, basically, HIPAA came out, uh, gave us a couple years. Uh, 2001, basically, was the Privacy Act that said you have to keep data private. And really what HIPAA did at that point in time was it really defined that there's, a, as far as the privacy, the EPHI. So you have the categories of what is personally identifiable data. Uh, so HIPAA gave us a good basis for that. At the same time, the executive office came out with OMB uh, A130. And I have a reference page in the back of this. But just looking up some of these things, if you're not familiar with them, uh, the, the Office of Management and Budget came out with the Circular 130, and really what that did was that defined for us that we have to have adequate security to protect private data, and that's for federal systems. So you kind of put yourself out and say, okay, federal system, I'm not a federal system. But the way at that point in time in 96 up to 2001, basically, federal grants and contracts were providing you, you know, a lot of dollars from research come from the federal government. And they were defining the data that you're gathering as you know, who owns it. The PI owns it, but really the sponsor is owning it in the federal governments. So they were setting the stage for these regulations to start coming out. So OM, OMB basically was setting the stage to say, we're going to identify data that you're collecting. We're going to tell you what categories, you know, PHI data, and now we're setting the stage to say that we are at least joint owners of that, and you need to start protecting it. So the OMB came out, and, and essentially they said that we have to protect the data. Uh, HIPAA came out in, initially right after that, and the Privacy Act came out then within HIPAA. Then two years later, security came out with HIPAA. Um, so that's basically where, where it started, HIPAA started. Um, the House, and, the House and Senate basically designed the laws, and there are public laws that are attached to these, these acronyms of HIPAA and FISMA and HITECH. So those are the laws, and they created the laws. It usually takes a couple years for the laws to go into effect, and then enforcement starts happening. Then the government agencies after that, so it's NIH, it's uh, National Science Foundation, uh, and the like, they start enforcing them by putting them into their contracts and everything. So NIH starts coming out, and we started having these collaborative networks. So Bob mentioned CTSA. CTSA is actually a contract, and the contracts basically have written into them regulated data must be protected, and it's partly federal data. So we start looking at the federal regulations for that. 
So NIH is doing that. FISMA comes out after HIPAA, and FISMA is the Federal Information Security Management Act. High Tech comes out just last year, basically, with the ARR, the Recovery Act, uh, and that causes breach laws. So there's more regulations that are involved with breach laws then. High tech, high tech is a title, uh, I think it's Title 13 of the, the Recovery Act. And high tech basically gives us the definition for what is a breach now. Everyone's been looking for that since HIPAA. Essentially, when HIPAA came out with the, the privacy, they said you've got to protect the data. And then the security part of HIPAA came out. And security said this, this is how you have to protect the data uh, technically as far as uh, – the controls that are in place, and they reference NIS, and I'll get I'll go into NIS in a minute. What are the letters? I'm sorry, high tech. Yeah. Um, it's it's uh, information technology. I'm not quite sure what the H is for that. I think health information. Health information. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll, I'll I'll lean on to my my roots of of IT for that. Um, the high tech for the breach laws basically are out there for. Uh, they define what is a breach. They define the numbers of when you get a quantity of breaches, who you have to report to, and who you have to, you know, you have to report, obviously, to the individual, but also to the federal government. And then coming out, uh, it's still pending right now, is some additional uh, uh, categories of FISMA that are coming out as far as reporting and enforcement of, of the current FISMA regulations. So on top of that, you have your internal institutional policies. Um, you have sponsors. So, so with uh, institutional policies, we do have you know, our own um, privacy policy that pretty much follows the regulations on you know, students and student information. And basically, the, the institutional policies are HIPAA-related, more so than FISMA-related. Um, because of grants, grants and contracts get more involved with FISMA. The sponsors then, by virtue of whether they're funding it or whether they claim data, and I'll say data ownership because when I talk about the VA in, in a couple minutes, the VA basically, when you're using VA data, it may be in another study, but they also claim joint ownership of that data that you're doing on your study if it contains VA data. So they have their regulations coming out of their security manuals for the VA that they want, they would like you to adhere to, and there's an agreement generally that you have to come up with for that. So, so those are the drivers, and then obviously the vendors with non-disclosures, if you're using some proprietary technology, they may not want data coming out for that, for like a medical device or so. Okay, so in addition, um, this is, this is, I wanted to touch on just uh, HIPAA 2, which is basically coming out uh, in probably in the next year. Well, I don't know. I won't get into elections, but it, it's, it's in process right now as far as getting uh, how EPH is going to be defined uh, much more clearly and that it's auditable. The HIPAA statements basically say they'll come out and they'll review what, what basically you're doing as far as your process. And now they're going to start enforcing. So it becomes auditable, and they want, to sh you, they want to have your records so that they can look through them to make sure that you're, you're performing due diligence on your, your security process. Uh, coming out this year, if, if it goes through, it's attached to a bunch of uh, – actually, this, this FISMA 2, what I call FISMA 2, is actually attached to the National Protection um, – NPA, the National Protection uh, Act – Audit and Act, I believe it is. Uh, it's a defense bill that's in there, and they have a clause in there for FISMA too. They're giving us enforcement of what we do in FISMA. They're providing us use cases on what we have to actually look at on our process when we're protecting data. And they're showing that we have to do more risk management on front of it, which is basically looking at how you're going to be handling the data and having a plan in place and then going back and having a program in place to review and make sure that your data is in a risk management, that you're, you're acknowledging that the data is risky, uh, you have protections in place, and you're, you have a program to make sure those, those protections are in an ongoing basis. Um, 
So, and then added management and overall controls is these two documents here from NIST uh, are essentially the control documents that tell you in very excruciating detail what type of controls the federal government requires if your data needs to be protected under a FSMA environment. Uh, GINA is, is the Genomics uh, Act that protects individuals against use of their genomics data for insurance claims. I have my first casualty. <laughs> I, I always get at least one. It's okay. I have to stand up here, so I have to bring it out that you, you know. Um, so, so what, what's happening right now with Gina, there's, there's some, some discussion on how we can bring genomics data into uh, protections, whether it's EPHI or not. There's, it's not explicit right now, and there's, there's talk of bringing uh, Gina into an EPHI category specifically so that it's, it's explicitly stated to be protected like the rest of the EPHI data defined under HIPAA. So moving on to this, um, this is my framework. This is, this is uh, an environment that we started a couple years ago uh, as being one entity within this, this multitude of 27 institutes and resources at Penn to have a FSMA compliant environment. And these steps are essentially, this is out under, under the NIST, uh, NIST.gov basically. Um, how you want to go through, and it's a framework to use, but the important thing is if you want details on how you start building a system to be FSMA compliant, these are the document numbers that will give you <clears throat> very good detail and very good following as far as uh, laying the groundwork. And what I want to get into real quickly in my last 10 minutes or so is I want to discuss the environment that we're building um, that tends to follow these these and actually has the controls built in place, which I'll touch on, that uh, can address FSMA compliance. Um, so my general rules are, obviously I said, uh, identify the data, keep access to it, <clears throat> excuse me, keep access to it at a minimum. Definitely use role-based access if you can. That way uh, access will be kept to a minimum. If you have a, a data manager that needs access to the data, as it's coming from source data, they don't need to have access to the analytical data. Uh, you want to do it role-based so that at the point in time when their workflow, when their process in the workflow is through, that the access is not granted at that point in time. And this is where I fall into with the IT. We need to design very clear demarcation boundaries because of this chain of custody that Bob was discussing. Um, and the environment that, that I'm going to describe next uh, allows that to happen. What we have is we have multiple IT entities managing your station. So you have a client desktop that may be managed by one organization. You have a server managed by another organization. At a point where you need to have FSMA compliance, you do need to have a clear demarcation point as far as who's going to be responsible for the data all the time, not just once, but all the time. Because it can't be you had it on your PC under PGP and you moved it to a server and there's three different entities that you have to talk to as far as getting something done. What we're finding now with more grants and contracts requiring FSMA, VA process requiring FSMA, they want security plans. So coming out of the wall now with these collaborative networks are individuals that say, I'm a PI, I need to have FSMA compliance, I have a DUA with CMS that requires FSMA compliance, I have a security plan I need to submit to my sponsor to get my proposal funded, can you give me yours? Because we have a security plan in my little pocket, in my little part of the world of Penn. And I say, no, sorry, I want to help you, no. Bring your project into this environment and I can do that, but I cannot lay claim and I cannot provide a security plan that will address all the controls that are needed. And there's 198, I believe, controls just in the one NIST document that they want you to at least check off and say what your risk value is on them. There. So, so what's happening is all every unit either has to develop a FSMA plan or has to move their operation somewhere else, and that's very disruptive. So, so what I'm I'm starting to do now is um, I'm building 
an environment that has a clear demarcation point that I can say, I can assure you the controls I have in place work, and this is where you can put your data. Now, I'm trying not to be complicating that you have to move your operations, so you need to have access to that. So with current technologies, virtualization, remote desktops and everything, and you see that out there, that's coming into an environment that we can maintain, and I can write the security plans for this FISM environment. So this is what this is what we're we have a pen. We're developing a new new version of it, and I'm going to drop drop right through this and go to this private data network. So the private research data network is complementary to the private clinical data network. I have six attributes here, and I'll go through them. Uh, one at a time and tell you just some of the technology part because technology is what I do. Um, there's, a, there's a secured network, high speed, we have lots of data, genomics data, very large quantity of it moving around, servers, so I'm building, well, it's built a uh, high speed network surrounding a group of servers. I have a common research portal, everyone heard the word portal. This research portal allows me to have login processes for researchers needing access to that environment. And very important, ID management all over the place. Everyone's got IDs. Probably each of you have at least two, if not five, if not ten different IDs for different things that you do. Um, this is yet another one. I'm sorry. It's yet another one because I have to control this. I have to manage this. This is where the chain of custody comes into effect. I create a user ID into this environment that you use to get access through the portal. The user ID has to be vetted. I have to know where they're from. I have to know who they are. I have to know when it started, and I have to know what they need access to, whether it's data, servers, software, because all of that has to be validated in these environments, and you have to keep records of all these things. So there is another ID management. Yes, we can federate with things, but the information I need is very important that I need to know where they're at, what projects they are. Inside it is, I use the word cloud. Everyone has to use the word cloud once in an IT environment, right? So I, I have a set of resources that are available to the researchers logging into this environment. And part of that resource is a virtual desktop that gets promoted to them so that they can use the resources of this environment. On top of that, then I have reporting and monitoring. So desktop, here's my, you know, my dynamic slide here. I have a, a client desktop. Don't care who manages it because I can't control that. In Penn, there's hundreds of investigators. I can't control the desktop. I can control this environment. This is my data network. I have high-speed data networks for streaming data. I have a high-speed network wrapped around it, 10 gigabits, which is basically what we run at the core of our university also, but it runs inside that environment, so there's fast throughput to the servers. I then have a research portal they log into. The research portal goes to the ID management system. This is very important, ID management. I use IBM's Tivoli products right now, but there's an ID management part that keeps, keeps track of the user IDs, who they are, what they're working with, where they come from, how long they can exist, when do I turn them on, when do I turn them off. It also has an access management part, which tells me they're working on project A, B, and C, and they have access to the groups of data that I have over here uh, file system one, two, and three. And that's all they can get access to coming out of this ID management system. The ID management system then talks to the provisioning engine. And this is, you know, this is the exciting part where we have a dynamic group of resources that we dynamically provision based on the user's profile. And it creates a virtual desktop and gives it back out to the user. Biostatisticians may have an eight core processor with 12 gig of memory and a couple of couple gigs of scratch space, and then they attach to the private data. They can have servers attached to them. They can create servers. We also have a grid and a couple other things in there, and we have our databases sitting back here in the back end connecting, feeding data through there. So this client desktop is not a pen client desktop. This can be any desktop because we have investigators across the country doing clinical trial work. It may be a clinical research investigator out in San Francisco entering data in their clinical trial. They still will log in through this, get their permissions to use their application that we've designed inside. That will be recorded here. They'll get provisioned, no desktop, because they're running one of our applications, but they'll get provisioned their application back out to their desktop. 
and that's the only part that they'll see. So from an external perspective to Penn, our clinical participants or our clinical sites that we have across the country will also be using this to enter their data and to log what resources they have available to them. Very important to keep track of that continuously. And the biggest part, like I said, is I'm doing two things in this environment. Usage and accounting is saying what the user is doing, what data they have access to, what data they have accessed, and, and how long they've been in and what they've been using. And I know it's a little bit, you know, big brother, but for physical compliance, we have to show those reporting on an ongoing basis as far as from a user perspective. From a data perspective, I'm doing monitoring and reporting of what systems are being used, who's accessing those systems, when the systems have been changed, change management of doing operating systems, software upgrades, and also application load. So we do system validation, we do software validation on our applications for the FDA, for FSMA. That gets reported inside this environment. That is what I am responsible for, and that is what I can report to the federal government. So I can write a security plan on how I protect that. Physical data centers, I have backup and recovery, I have users I know, I have data that doesn't go anywhere but in here, and that provides me with the basis of having an audit done and being as FISMA compliant as you can be, at least at this point in time. So that's the environment that, that is at Penn. These are the references. Uh, I, I will ask, I don't know if you have handouts of this, but I could certainly provide this at whatever convenience you want. You can it's, contact it's me. Rating. You'll really enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> Each of these manuals are only between one and 350 pages a piece. So, and I think I'll break at this point in time. And Bob, if you want to do closing remarks and then questions and answers. And I had a couple of closing remarks, but I'm not even going to bother with uh, I think we've covered every, everything adequate. The only thing I'll say in closing is yeah, I remember when privacy and security and everything was accomplished by having a database on your PC. And it just doesn't work like that anymore. Starting to assume a very different scale. So, have you had any breaches of your system from uh, um, mal malefactors that <laughs> people are looking to do? And not necessarily do harm to you, but just. Uh, I will, I, will mention, I will mention one incident that we've had. We've had no breaches as defined. Uh, the one... No serious adversity. Yeah. We, we've, we've, had, we've had no leakage of data, of clinical data, from the systems that we manage. That's, that's where I can go with this statement. The one thing we did have was a denial of service before this environment was developed about three and a half years ago, about three years ago, where the client at that time... The client's outside our environment right now, but at one point in time we had a network with the clients in them, so we were managing clients and users and you know help desk and the whole thing. We had a denial of service, which we shut down because the clients got a virus, as they're still very prevalent out there. The client propagated the virus in the network, and at that point in time the network was you know basic one gig, you know one one gigabyte tight network running, and all the clients had started pulling everything, and it prevented service. So what happened at that point in time is our database is shut down because they sense that. We have them in a separate subnet. And our data stores locked up because of the propagation on the network. So our clients were compromised from this virus, and it was basically a denial of service. It wasn't a, comp it wasn't a breach. Okay, it was a denial of service. And that was the last incident that we've, we've had uh, within our been, environment. Have there been data problems at Penn? <laughs> yeah. But those are usually internally caused <laughs> in my experience. <laughs> so, could you talk a little bit about de identification and data sharing? De identification is, it's a, if I may say just a, a few things, de identification is very adequate for some situations. The, the problem that I'm finding with the identification is it works up to a point. It works up to a point. Um, the identification is subject to interpretation. So some people will remove certain rows being subjects. Some people will remove certain columns being specific type of data. The columns are subject to interpretation, and what I'm seeing is that every time somebody removes 
removes a column, they want to, if they remove the visit date, they want a new derived variable that states a window or a time. So as you do identify, you start to develop more and more derived variables that you want to use in place. Um, so it becomes an exercise in you know, sort of expending a lot of effort to de identify. And you start to think to yourself logically, well, rather than de identify, I want this data to be really useful and valuable. So does it need to be identified and properly protected so that we can use it analytically in a protected state? If you're going to strip it, you're going to send it to somebody on CD because they want the data. Okay. But I, but I question the, the degree to which very complex, voluminous data can really be an analytical value. Those are just like, that's, that's the sentiment I have not think we want to develop any more than one CD on site. But what's your solution to data sharing? Publish data sharing. <laughs> well, Public you use know, data there, sharing. there is. There, there are, everyone knows there are points in the project. And yes, at the end, you have to develop, you know, composite data sets that represent the raw data and the analytical data. And those must be shipped to the NIH to the repository. Um, but there's, there's, and that has to be identified. But there's a great deal of activity in between closing things up identifying the data for the final time and sending it and sharing it. And the eight years in between where you've got intensive analytical activity, where we identify the data is And it's causing a lot of other effort. And a lot of that effort may not be reimbursed by the sponsor. Yeah. That, that's what you're finding is yeah. a lot of this activity yeah. Bob was talking about actually occurs after the end of the study and also the end of funding. Right, and sometimes after Oops. key personnel and we're going somewhere else. Well, it's all said and done. You can you can share it out, but in between pre-identified data, it's. Do you know of any any work that's been done on the use of shared data? I mean, you know, we we have these laws and regulations, but I don't see. I, I'm not aware of any any study to find out whether or not it's reused or how much of that stuff is used? Good question. I think that's I, it. I, you know, it, like, like any discussion, you're inevitably drawn. Has anyone accrued metrics that indicate that this is being used, that this is of value? Um, there's certainly plenty of people that are putting forth legislation and say that we must protect these things. Yeah, well, I think we're reaching the end of our time. Jim and Bob are going to be here for a while. If anyone would like to meet with them, I'm going to be meeting with them and so are several others. Don't be here for a while. And we're meeting upstairs at 10 o'clock, 6130, E6130. So thank you very much, Jim and Bob, for joining uh, us today. A, a sincere thanks to you. Thank for, you for taking an interest in this. Thank you. Thank you.